just to turn ready, we'll be going through uh, the book of Acts and uh, we're in chapter 16, I think. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> but anyway, um, well some people like to read books. I don't know about you but some people like to read books. Some people like to watch movies. And some people, well, they're not into reading or watching, they want to be out doing. And uh, I think most people, if not all people, like a good adventure. Moving into uncharted waters, new discoveries, the unknown around each corner, lurking danger, moments of peaceful bliss broken by storms of fury. The excitement of fresh experiences, the adrenaline of captivated freefall. Times of the uneventful mixed with the thrill of events so full and many that you can't keep up. This morning I want us to look at the adventure of life, his life. The adventure that God's life is in us. And uh, to do that we're going to continue on through uh, our, our acts. And uh, we've been going through Acts and one of the things about Acts is God's leading. And uh, we see a lot of God's leading. Of course Jesus in the early parts of Acts said to his followers to wait and then you will receive. That which was promised after Jesus' death, his resurrection and his ascension came the promise, the Holy Spirit. And they had to wait for him to come and he was going to come and they were going to receive him into their lives. So they're sitting in a, or they're, they're in a room, an upper room at Pentecost of course and the room is filled with the sound of a rushing violent wind. Tongues of fire appeared to sit on them, to rest on them and then they speak in other languages. God's Holy Spirit's arrived. And he's come into the believer. Now that they have the Holy Spirit within, what do you see as we go through the book of Acts? Well, we see Spirit-inspired messages, notably from Peter and Stephen. There's Spirit-filled leadership. We have the apostles filled with the Holy Spirit uh, leading the people. They even find deacons to serve who are full of the Holy Spirit. We find the Holy Spirit bringing comfort and joy to the church, to the believers. And all through is God's leading, his Holy Spirit leading. We find him leading Philip to go and talk to the Ethiopian eunuch and to jump into his chariot. And then when he finishes with him, the Holy Spirit snatches him away. And then he finds himself somewhere else to, to minister the gospel. Of course, Peter was led by the Holy Spirit to go to Gentiles, something which was not part of their custom. In fact, it was unlawful in the old scheme of things to do. But God's Holy Spirit is leading. And as we get closer to our passage, we find other uh, points where, where God's Spirit is giving direction. In uh, chapter 13 and verse 2 and 4 it talks about this missionary journey of, of Paul and Barnabas and while they were ministering to the Lord, the group that had gathered together and they were fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then in verse 4 it says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. God's spirit is at work and it's his, he's at work within their lives, leading, guiding, directing. We know that the Gentiles were upset by some people saying that you had to be circumcised in order to be saved, which was of course false. And so there's this, this council at Jerusalem that meet and they write this letter that was to be sent out to the churches. And in that letter it says, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than some essential things. God's Holy Spirit is at work. Not only 
telling them where to go, but even telling them where not to go. Last week we, we even looked at it, chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. And they passed through the Phry Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And in verse 7 it says, And when they had come to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Believers in Jesus now have his leading within, giving guidance, giving direction. Doug mentioned it last week, Romans 8.14, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are, these are the sons of God. But you know, verse 9 in the very same chapter of Romans says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If God's Spirit is not in you, you do not belong to him. To know God's leading and to know his life, there is one essential ingredient. Essential ingredient. And that is faith. Variously understood as trust, belief, dependence, but it's faith. You must have faith. Full faith, complete faith, total faith. You know, the Israelites who were in Egypt, slaved and slaved to the Egyptians, they came out of Egypt. And they knew God's leading. There was this pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to show them, to lead them, to guide them out of Egypt and through the wilderness. In Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 19 it says, You, God, you in your great compassion did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not leave them by day to guide them on their way nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way in which they were to go. You know, we can know God's leading through his word, through other believers, through the fellowship here. But for the Israelites in the wilderness, you know, they were never forsaken by God. He was there all the whole time. He didn't take his leading away from them, but they forsook him by not believing in him and by not trusting in him. They kept going back to Egypt. They, they, whenever they were tested, they, they'd complain and whinge. They weren't trusting in God. They weren't believing in him for what he was going to do. Destined for the promised land, that generation never made it. Their carcasses were buried in the wilderness for lack of... Of faith. Their hearts kept hardening and turning back to Egypt. You can't trust God and trust in yourself at the same time. It doesn't work. The Bible calls it being lukewarm. Vomit. He vomits that out of his mouth. You can be a part-time Christian but you'll know full-time discouragement. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. God requires full faith, giving over of your life to know his life. It's the only way. But here's a marvellous thing. We don't have time to go into it, but when we look at God's leading there, it starts with Moses and a flaming bush. Follow the flame. God's angel speaks to Moses from this bush that's on fire, but it's not being consumed. And then we find a fire leading the Israelites through the wilderness, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Then they're told to build a tabernacle, a travelling tent where, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and it represented God's presence with them. And that cloud would come and, and be inside that or hover over and be around, surround that tabernacle. And when it lifted up, it was time for them to go, to move.
But when it sat there, it was time for them to, to stay and to wait. And at night, it looked like a burning heath around the tabernacle. And then they build the, the temple and this glory cloud, the Shekinah glory, filled the temple. It's no coincidence that at Pentecost, they see flames of fire resting on those who are believers because God's spirit has now come into us. We are now temples of the Holy Spirit and we can know God's leading from within. Romans 8.16 says, The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The internal witness that you belong to him. His leading and guidance within you. The one who says, aha, more than your conscience. And the one in you that says, uh-uh, God's leading, God's spirit within. Well, there's God's leading and required is faith, total faith, complete faith in him. Can't be any other way. But also with this adventure of life is God's surprises. God's surprises. I'd like to start by saying our thoughts are not God's thoughts and his ways are not our ways. It tells us that in Isaiah. Well, we come to Acts chapter 16 and it's our passage and just before we come to the passage, just a little recap over last week with the message that Doug brought to us. Uh, verses 9 and 10 it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul has this vision, this sight in his, in his mind. A Macedonian man standing and appealing to him, saying, Come, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. God's leading, God's direction, he's saying, they concluded that God was telling them to go to preach the gospel there. He'd open up the door. So from the vision of the Macedonian man asking them to come and to help them, what do you expect might happen from that? What do you think? Well, we're told what happens. And this is really our passage for this morning. Uh, Acts 16, verses 11 to 15. It says there, Therefore, putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. And a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshipper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptised, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. God's surprises. Paul had a vision of a Macedonian man saying, Come. What do we find happens? Paul is led to speak to a group of women. And one woman responds, Lydia. And she's from Thyatira. She's actually not from Macedonia. She has a house there. She probably works there, well off by the seams of things. But Macedonia is on the European continent. I don't have a map for us this morning. But Macedonia is on the European continent. Thyatira, where she's from, is from Asia a city in Asia, some miles away. Can you see God's working? He's calling Paul into Macedonia to speak to someone who actually comes from Thyatira. God working in Paul's life and Lydia's life to bring them to a place 
where God brings his message to one who is ready for him. It's no accident. God orchestrating events, not according to what we might think. He might have thought he was going into Macedonia to speak to a group of men perhaps and have a great response from the people within Macedonia itself. He goes to a group of women and one responds. God working according to his greater purpose. Not only that, some days after this event, we're going to read how Paul and Silas end up getting flogged and thrown into a prison. Were they expecting that? Why? Because the reason they are flogged and thrown into a prison is because God has an appointment with the jailer and his household and his family. And here's the excitement and the adventure of life. It's anticipation in following God to see what he is doing and what he is going to do. The adventure of life is his life. It's not about our lives. It's about his life. Living is about God and what he has done in you and what he will do through you. That's what the Bible calls life. To truly live as we were created and meant to live is to know God in your life for he is your life. Outside of him is death. What we think is life is not life at all. We think life's about me, what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. We think eternal life is about me living forever. Let me tell you what life isn't. Life isn't my life or the life that I find in others, whether that be my children or my family or my friends. That's not what the Bible is calling life. Life isn't what I do or what I don't do. The good things I do, the bad things I don't, or the bad things I do and the good things I don't. That's not life. Life isn't who I am or who I think I am. Or who I am not. Life isn't about what I have, what I possess, the things I own. It's, it's not about what I have and it's not about what I don't have. Some people think they have life because they don't have anything. It's not about that. You know, the deceiver wants us to think we have life because of these things. And it's a subtle ploy and a subtle deception. Life is God and Christ. His life and his life in us. Eternal life is not living my life eternal, eternally. It's living his life forever. That's life. Him who is eternal and him who is life living in me and it starts today. Of Jesus the Bible says in him was life. And the life was the light of men. In John 17, 3 it says, And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And the Apostle John also in a letter, he spent time with Jesus. He saw him, he heard him, he handled him. He says this in his first letter, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. It's Jesus Christ. Him who is eternal and him who is life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Life is in him and it's him in you. The adventure of life, his life, it's about God's leading. It's about God's surprises. 
and looking at what he's doing and anticipation of what he is going to do. But it begins and it continues, it begins and it continues by his calling on your life. Paul took the gospel message into Macedonia. In Acts 16 and verse 10, after the vision, we see that he says we concluded that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so he does. And so he goes. And in chapter 16, verse 14, it says, And a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshipper of God was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Lydia stood at the threshold, the precipice of decision. Decision at God's revelation of himself, God opening her heart and revealing himself to her. God is calling to her and telling her to jump. Trust me. I won't let you go. I'll catch you. I'll embrace you. Just believe in me. Jesus is saying, come, follow me. Stop standing on the rocky cliff face. Let go of whatever it is you're holding on to, whatever you're standing on to, trust me. When God opens your heart, when he opens your eyes and your ears to see him, don't harden your heart. Don't shut off your eyes. Don't block off your ears and shut him out. He stands at the door knocking. Let him in. Be embraced by him. When God in revelation calls you, draws you, beckons you, and you know when he is, you feel it here. He feels it on, on your life. He convicts. He says, come to me, trust me. He beckons. He calls. You know when it's God. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to him. He speaks to your heart and you know it. And when he does, there of necessity, there must be a response. There has to be. It's a yes or it's a no. Don't make excuses. That's to say no to him. You know, captivated free fall in the adventure of life is to let go of yourself. Whatever you're holding on to and fully trust him, knowing that he's got you and he's got every situation you could ever face in this life. He's got it. You'll enter freedom and rest that you never knew was possible because you trust him. You stop trusting in yourself. That's where anxiety and stress is. It's so rampant today because we're trusting in ourselves. We need to trust him. You begin this adventurous life, his life, by responding to him and you continue in this life, his life, in the same way. Responding and walking in the revelation of his life in you. Completely trusting him for everything. Don't think that giving him your life means you have to sell everything and become a missionary. Mm -mm. Unless he asks you to or he puts that desire in your heart, just don't. You don't have to do things for him like that to become. You don't become a missionary. You are a missionary if he's in you. You don't need to think that to be spiritual you have to give up what you're doing and become a pastor or a, or a full-time Christian worker and be in a paid position like that. If he's in you, you are spiritual. And you are in his service full time. Whether you're studying veterinary, whether you're working on a farm, driving a truck, getting kids ready for school, teaching, maybe you're retired. Whatever, you're his and he's yours. 
You don't do in order to be. You are and so you do. You don't do in order to be. You are and so you do. 24-7, whatever or wherever you are, you're his. Whatever you do. If you fear that he'll ask you to give up your house, your work, your friends, your family, then you know what it is that you're holding on to. He convicts you of that. Let go. Don't physically give them away or up unless he asks you to. Only give them up to him. Give them over to him and give your heart wholly to him. All he's asking for is for you to trust him, to believe in him, to give him your life and you'll live his. You'll find what it means to be created by God and in his image. That's our whole purpose. That's where meaning, fulfilment and joy, God in us. He's made it possible through Jesus Christ. I just want to conclude by, probably not normal, but I'm just going to read to you from the book of Hebrews. And uh, just listen to these words. And listen to God. Hebrews chapter 3, it says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, and he's going to quote from Psalm chapter 95, Today, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. And he's going to talk about the children of Israel in the wilderness. And maybe you're in the wilderness today. Do not harden your heart as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. You may have seen God at work. You may have experienced his work. Don't try him. Don't test him. Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And he continues. He says, take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God to trust in anything else but him. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. Christ has come into you, you partaker of him. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end, you'll know his fullness of salvation and joy in your life now, in your walk. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient, those who would not trust him? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. You can't trust God in yourself at the same time. Therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, did not benefit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. The answer to life, his life, is faith and trust complete in him. For we who have believed enter that rest. Do you know his rest? Have you entered his rest? Do you want to know his rest? Trust him. Do business with God today. If God has spoken to your heart, you need to do business with him. You need to talk to him. 
Open your heart to him. Be embraced by him. I, I, I can say all the words I want, but it's up to you. He calls you and he'll do it all. You just have to let go and give. Give it all to him. And you'll know a life, his life. I can't tell you what that is till you accept it. And you'll know it like you've never seen it. I never felt it. I never enjoyed it. His life in you. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, I want to thank you that, that you are a great God. You're a mighty God. And this life we live, it's not about us. You didn't make us just to do our own thing, to do our own pleasure. You made us for your glory, Lord, to shine in us. And, Lord, that you are our life. Lord, even the trees were made to glorify you. They just need to be. Lord, help us to trust you. Lord, I know your spirit works. Your spirit convicts. You knock. You stand knocking. You begging. You're asking us to jump and trust you. Lord, we don't have to do anything except trust and believe. And Lord, you've done it all. You've done it all in Jesus. Oh Lord, this morning, I pray that there'll be those here this morning that do business to you and enter that rest and know your life and to know your joy and to know your comfort. You've got it. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.